So the iPad event just wrapped up and it's pretty much exactly what we expected, but let's go through everything that was announced and what I think about the new Final Cut Pro updates, the new Final Cut camera for iPhone, and is it better than the Blackmagic camera app? Let's dive into it. So first up, they talked about the iPad Air. The general gist here is you get more Pro features for less. Pretty typical, as soon as Apple comes out with a new Pro model, those features from the previous model kind of get trickled down into the Air. Now comes in an 11 and 13 inch model. It got updated to the M2 chip, comes in multiple colors, 50% faster CPU, 3% faster GPU, and honestly, my most favorite update in all of these iPads is the landscape camera. Because man, am I tired of holding it like this and having the camera blocked so Face ID doesn't work or FaceTime or anything. But now let's talk about iPad Pro. So apparently this is Apple's thinnest product ever coming in at even thinner than the iPod Nano. Now I know Apple's always been obsessed with the crazy thin design and don't get me wrong, I love the aesthetic, but when it comes to Pro devices, I think we'd all agree that keeping it the same thickness as even this still crazy thin previous generation iPad Pro or, and sit down, make it even a little thicker so that way we can have an insane battery life. I don't think pros would complain about the extra weight, but I digress. We have the same 11 and 13 inch model. This is interesting because it's basically 0.1 inches bigger than the previous, this is a 12.9 inch, so now you have a 13 inch, so I doubt you're gonna be able to perceive the difference there. They've now gone to OLED panels, but they're actually stacking two OLED panels on top of each other to achieve the HDR brightness needed for HDR workflows and kind of that Pro Display XDR type quality that we've come to expect from the Pro line. Apple's calling this tandem OLED and it has a thousand nits of consistent brightness with 1600 peak. But what I'm actually excited for is you can now get it in the nano textured glass, which basically is a lower glare matte option, which I love matte displays. When it comes to performance, of course, we have the new M4 chip, kind of jumping that M3 in the iPad Pro lineup. It's got a 10 core GPU and CPU, just ridiculous numbers. I mean, in my opinion, there are very few people out there probably maxing the performance capacity of the iPad Pro. I mean, even on this generation right here, I can run full-blown DaVinci Resolve, Final Cut Pro, switching back and forth between apps, having 8K ProRes footage. And while yes, maybe exporting render times is an important factor that I'm happy to see have faster output, I'm not getting too caught up in the whole 50% faster than the previous generation when the previous generation is still crazy fast. But always nice to see performance bumps, I guess. When it comes to cameras, I was expecting a little bit more, but we basically just have the same 4K ProRes video, an enhanced LiDAR scanner, a new True Tone flash that what it will do is take multiple exposures when it's recognizing you're scanning a document. This will get rid of unwanted shadows. Just like the Air, we now get the landscape camera. Yay. Funny enough, and of course they're not gonna actually mention this, but anyone with eyes can see it, they did remove the ultra wide camera from the iPad. If you ask me, this isn't much of a loss. I really don't know anyone who has ever used the main camera to film anything, but let alone the ultra wide camera. So I'm perfectly fine with the iPad just having one decent camera on the back of it. Of course, we also got some new accessories, the new Magic Keyboard, basically just thinner, and they added the function row and a larger trackpad. It's pretty cool, and as someone who owns the current generation model. I will say it is nice, very, very expensive. Honestly, the only reason that I go with first party accessories a lot of the time and kind of eat that extra add on cost is what a lot of people don't talk about is the fact that first party accessories directly linked to a product like the iPad are covered under the same Apple Care warranty. So I pay for Apple Care on a monthly basis for my iPad Pro, and that means my Apple Pencil and the Magic Keyboard are both covered. So if my very expensive uh, keyboard gets ruined, damaged, whatever, I can go in and replace it for a much smaller deductible. And then we got the new Apple Pencil Pro. This one I'm having a hard time with, to be honest, and I'm gonna need your help in the comments. Now going into this, I was trying to withhold some high expectations, but I just got too excited at the thought of a new Apple Pencil that would be directly supported with 
the Vision Pro, hoping that could be some sort of physical interface. And while this still could be true, we could see it at WWDC with Vision OS 2 or anything. At least at this event, the new Pencil has no affiliation to the Vision Pro or any other device, except for the new iPad Pro and the iPad Air, which is nice. While it looks exactly the same as the second generation, all of the upgrades happened internally. Most notably is you now get haptic feedback and it has a new roll functionality to it in addition to squeezing. So by squeezing, you can bring up a new interface to have different tools on the iPad and then you can actually roll the iPad to select from those tools. Obviously, third-party developers can take advantage of these new features, and we saw the Procreate CEO talk about how they're utilizing it in their new apps. This all looks very cool, and I was kind of scared for the price point. They're essentially just making it 129, the same price as the second-gen model. And as I check the website, the Apple Pencil second-gen, this guy does not go down in price, so it's still 129. So for 129, you can either get this Apple Pencil or the Pro one. The weird part is the compatibility, unfortunately, the latest Pencil is only available on the newer iPad Pros and iPad Air. So you'll have to upgrade iPads if you want to try the new Pencil. Unfortunately, for some Apple reason, it is not available on the previous generation Pro models. I'm sure to any like drawing artist out there or animation, this is a nice bump and update. But to me personally, uh, I think they could have done more with the Pencil. An eraser of some kind would have been nice. <laughs> I was so excited that we were gonna get a dedicated segment to Final Cut Pro and Logic Pro for iPad updates. Now first, let me reverse it and start with my disappointments. One, for Final Cut, we really didn't see any editing updates. We didn't get any sort of interface feature add-ons to the actual editing experience. And when it came out last year, there's a lot lacking in its pro editing experience. And I said when they launched it that because they are going a subscription model, we should be seeing more updates throughout the year, in my opinion. New title packs, new editing features, subscription models mean that we should be seeing more updates over time. Compared to if this was just like a one-time $25 buy or even $50, whatever, that would be more understandable to just see incremental updates every year or two, and we've all seen Final Cut Pro for max track record, one small update every three or four years. So I'm a little disappointed in that. But what they did announce, this live multicam and Final Cut camera is really cool. So essentially for your iPad, you're going to be able to connect up to four cameras and they didn't specify which cameras, but they were only showing iOS type cameras, so I'm guessing other iPhones, maybe even iPads as cameras. I'm the first person to be in line saying yes to the quality of the iPhone cameras. I don't think it's a loss if you can't connect like a mirrorless camera in some way. It makes sense to use the easy to connect iOS devices and have a multicam experience. I genuinely believe this is a setup that a lot of events, podcasts, will end up using. But as someone who doesn't really do multicam stuff on the iPad, I'm more interested in the dedicated camera app for the iPhone. Because as they mentioned, this is supposedly a great standalone app with manual controls. This is Apple saying, here is our pro camera app. My first feeling is why not just build it in to the stock camera iOS app? But I have a feeling they really just don't wanna overcomplicate that stock camera app in fear of losing out on uh, a lot of the existing user base and overcomplicating it. We only got a couple screenshots of what the camera app is going to look like, but let's take a look. It is cool that on the iPad, uh, the director holding the iPad will be able to adjust camera controls remotely. This can be huge, so you can have cameras mounted places or operators that don't really need to worry about exposure and white balance, and you can change that all on the iPad. So here's our first screenshot of the Pro Camera app. And while it's recording, we don't see much. We can see what lens is being used. Uh, we can see the runtime. We can see audio meters in the top left. We can see, I'm guessing, how much record time we have available to us and our battery. And that's pretty much it. So here we can see what that arrow would reveal. It looks like 
AF at the top, so we can choose between autofocus or manual focus. Uh, we can see the same exposure icon that we have pretty much in the, in the stock camera app. And this seems to be just an exposure slider, so still not actual control over your shutter speed and ISO. It's basically just adjusting the two to balance. We'll have white balance control. Basically all you're gaining here is the ability to do autofocus, manual focus, and color temp control. Of course, I'll be curious what codec and quality this is going to be. You're not automatically transferring ProRes Apple log footage. And I doubt this is gonna be as professional as it transfers like a small H.265 file, but then saves an Apple log ProRes version locally so you can like proxy it up later and swap it out. It's not gonna be that intense of a workflow. Finally, they allow you to have Final Cut projects on a drive and not just internally. <laughs> Logic also got an update. To be honest, I'm not a musician, so the new plugin stuff, while it looks really cool with the visualizers, that's not my forte. But one of the features they did point out that I think should be implemented into Final Cut, both on the Mac version and the iPad version, is the stem splitter option. This is pretty much what Blackmagic has implemented in the latest version of DaVinci Resolve, where you can take a music track and single out certain parts of the track, literally, I think, into the same certain sectors. You can mute the voice, you can have just drums, you can, any combination of the instruments and vocals. This would be perfect inside of Final Cut, and I'm not really sure why they didn't implement the same technology in both apps. And there you have it. That is basically the Apple event in a nutshell. And we did see at the end that this was all shot on an iPhone. I knew it. I knew cinematic mode in the first couple of the fuzzy little edges around everybody, but it still looked great. Showing Apple can use their iPhone edited on a Mac and iPad uh, to create an amazing production. I don't want to see a bunch of comments about, yeah, but they're still using six figures worth of lighting and other film equipment. That's just how the film industry works, but it's cool that they can use an iPhone to create an awesome image. What do you guys think about the Apple event? Let me know down in the comments below. Got a lot of awesome stuff coming up in the near future, so make sure you're subscribed. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video.